Okay, I've promoted both Greg and Dan. I got my device's rolling chair and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anthony. Good evening and welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Morro Bay Planning Commission. It is June 21st and we're a little bit after six o'clock. We had some technical difficulties, but we are now live and ready to roll. Um, we will, we have a quorum. We are missing two commissioners, um, Mr. Rodriguez and Mr. Roshan, but um, we have Ms. King and Mr. Ingrafia. So we are ready to go. Um, we will start with a moment of silence. Thank you for that. And any planning commissioner announcements? Seeing none, we're going to move on to public comment. Uh, this is the time for comments on anything not on the agenda this evening or something for which you cannot stay until later. Anthony, do we have anybody in the queue for public comment? Uh, thank you, Chair Stewart. Currently, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. All right, so we will move on to the consent calendar. We just have the one item, our current and advanced planning and processing list. Do we have any comments or questions on that? Nope, okay. So the recommendation is to receive and file. We will do so. Moving along to public hearings, uh, the first one or the one and only is B1, site location 2900 Alder Avenue, although this has been pulled um, with a request that we continue to a date uncertain, but we will go ahead, um, have Ms. Hubbard introduce it and um, then go to public comment on that since it is on the agenda. Sure, Stuart, you, um, I think we just want to continue the item, but we do, okay. because we noticed it, we want to want to take any public comment that might okay. be coming forward. So okay. if you want to ask for public comment, then, uh, then we can go from there. Okay, so we don't need anything from Nancy then. All right, so do we have any public comment on this item, Anthony? Uh, thank you, Chair Stewart. Currently, I see Betty Wendeltz with her hand raised. Betty, All right. you are That's unmuted. Thank you. This is Betty Winholtz. Um, I have a, 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 I think a question and a comment. Um, one, I'm assuming this is the empty lot uh, near the bar there that's uh, right there on San Jacinto between Alder and um, Bur um, Birch. Um, and if that's not true, please correct me. Um, I'd, I'd like a definition or if the city even has a definition of what a um, self-contained hotel is. Um, by the description, it sounds like it's a, in a sense, glorified vacation rental with several together, uh, much like the one that was approved off of uh, down by the Embarcadero. Um, over the on the bluff overlooking the Embarcadero where there is no amenities in terms of a person who's there to answer questions or service people if something should happen. Um, so can you distinguish for me what a self uh, serving hotel is if it's any different from a vacation rental. And then it says that it is in the specific plan is that the Main Street specific plan that it's in um, as well. Um, those would be my comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Anybody else in the queue? Thank you, Chair. Uh, currently, I do not see any raised hands left in the queue. Thank you. So back to staff, are we able to answer those questions? Um, it is the vacant lot and it is what it says it is. It's a self-service hotel meeting. Um, yeah, they wouldn't have uh, a front desk or, or that type of service. Um, Nancy's here too, if there's uh, anything you want to add to that, Nancy. It's, it's really a more modern style of hotel for something that's small. It doesn't, it's not efficient for them to have full-time staff. So it's really like you get a key or a um, code to open the door. And it's like a lot of places, if you end up going there after hours, you get you get instructions for how to get in. They have numbers posted for neighbors that have issues if there's noise or parking or some other issue 
They have uh, people 24 seven available for the guests if they have questions. And there is staff that comes during the day to do room turnovers, but they're not there full time and they don't have offices there. Okay, that clarifies. I think also it sounds like, you know, it's gonna be more of a bedroom with a bathroom rather than a full house that would have kitchens and living rooms and that sort of thing. So I guess I, I totally understand what Ms. Winholtz is talking about because we have seen these and they do seem a lot like a little mini vacation rental and in a way they are. It's just a different format for this kind of hotel service. And I think, I think quite frankly, the lines are a little bit blurred between the two because even hotels are listed on like platforms like Airbnb and VRBO. So, you know, I mean, you, you, you get a lot of those sort of cross-referencing on both of those things. I'm sure several of you have booked hotel rooms through those facilities. So um, not an uncommon thing, so. Okay. All right, then um, if staff doesn't, or excuse me, if commissioners don't have any questions, I would look for a motion to continue this item to a date uncertain. Uh, I'll move that we continue it. Thanks, Joe. Asia, you wanna be the second? Sure. All right. So we have a motion and a second, any discussion? Seeing none get my view here so I can see everybody. There we go. All right, all in favor? Do we have, yes. who, who wants to call this one? Scott, do you wanna do it or Nancy? Sure, that's fine. Um, uh, Commissioner Ingrafia? Uh, yes. Commissioner King? Yes. Chairperson, Chairperson Stewart? Yes. Motion passes 3-0, thank you. All right, thank you. On to new business. We have a presentation of the annual water supply and demand assessment and recommendation for allocation of water equivalency units for federal year 2022-23. Um, and I believe we have Mr. Qualick here to present that. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, very excited to be here. I believe this is my first time presenting to the Planning Commission. So. Uh, I've been part of the city for about a year now, so I'm I, uh, excited about this opportunity. Let me share my screen. Give me one second. Okay, I believe you can all see that. Um, sorry, I forgot to fill in the item number there, but uh, this presentation is on the annual water supply and demand assessments and also the allocation of water equivalency units for fiscal year 22-23. Um, as you know, uh, this is an item that comes before the Planning Commission every year. Um, typically, there, there was a, a, a different analysis of water supply and demand. We now have this new tool uh, that's formally called the Annual Water Supply and Demand Assessment um, that's part of our freshly adopted urban water management plan. So we, we are now using this assessment uh, in order to inform recommendations about the WEUs. So moving on, a uh, brief uh, outline here. I'll give a uh, short background on the city's water supply. We'll go through our analysis in the water supply and demand assessment, as well as the associated water shortage contingency plan. And we'll talk about what that is. I'll go over some of our water strategies uh, for this year. And then we'll talk about the water equivalency units and the recommended allocation by staff. So background, uh, Morro Bay has two sources of water currently. We have state water and we have water coming out of the Morro Basin. So um, many of you know that the uh, city is a subcontractor sub to San Luis Obispo County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. Um, and that's how we get our state water. The state water goes to them first and then we, we get it from them. Um, they get around 25,000 acre feet per year from the state. So the city and 10 other subcontractors um, pull about 4,800 acre feet of that per year. And uh, the city and those subcontractors also purchase around 5,700 acre feet as, as drought buffer. The remaining um, 14 and a half thousand or so gets stored by the district. Um, I'd like to just go through this table because I think it, it provides some clarity. 
uh, on on kind of what this looks like at at the county level. So <clears throat> um, here you can see Morro Bay is actually the largest uh, state water subcontractor uh, that's that's subcontracting under the, the district with 13, 13 per year. Pismo is a close second and the rest are, are a bit farther back, but they're much smaller uh, water districts. Uh, you may also note that Morro Bay also purchases a lot of drought buffer. Uh, we purchase 2,290 acre feet a year of, of drought buffer. Um, that gets stored, if not used, that gets stored for us uh, in San Luis Reservoir. Um, but occasionally spills, and that's you know another discussion. Um, for a total allocation for a city of Morro Bay of 3,600 acre feet per year. Just like to note that the district has an unsubscribed allocation of um, 14,000 and a half acre feet per year, as mentioned before. Uh, that the, the district also stores that water in the San Luis Reservoir, and that that's going to become important uh, for discussion we'll be having here. So, uh, and just to give you a map, we have the California aqueduct uh, running roughly parallel to the five. Uh, it branches off to the coastal branch, um, goes through some pumps, um, gets treated at Polonio Pass, and then comes down gravity. Um, and we have the Choro Valley pipeline here that is the one that supplies Morro Bay. Uh, as you can see, the green uh, represents districts that are uh, um, subcontractors for state water. So there's actually not too many of them in San Luis Obispo County. You have Avila, uh, Oceano, Morro Bay, Pismo. Uh, small one up here. I don't. I don't know. I think it's Shandon. Uh, so outside of state water, we have the Morro Basin. So we have a well field that has six wells. It's around the Ly Lila Kaiser Park area, and we're permitted currently to pull 581 acre feet per year. Uh, the water in the basin um, does have nitrates, and that means uh, it must be treated through our brackish water reverse osmosis facility, which is pictured here. Uh, during that treatment process, we lose around 25% of that water. So. I believe it's somewhere around 450 acre feet per year that 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 were permitted to um, take out of the basin uh, once treated. So again, that's just a very general overview, high level overview of our water supply currently. Um, we'll jump into the water supply and demand assessment. So this is a California code requirement now. We have to submit it to Department of Water Resources once a year on July 1st. And it is an evaluation of our utility's ability to reliably provide water for the current year that we're in, plus one additional dry year. So we have to assume an additional dry year um, in this analysis. So this year, we have a pretty low allocation from the state for state water. We only have a 5% allocation, which is 180 acre feet uh, to us. Uh, and we get that by adding together our 1313 allocation plus the drought buffer that we purchase, and then we multiply it by five. That's, that's how the state works with the formula. Uh, we access our own stored water in, uh, from San Luis Reservoir, as well as the district stored water. So as I mentioned before, the district is using this 14,000 or so uh, acre feet per year and storing it. And then the city is also storing our, our own water um, in San Luis Reservoir. So um, because we're only getting 180 acre feet this year, uh, we, we have to look for, for other, other water. Well, actually the state water is still giving us more than 180 feet. They're just giving us the stored water from San Luis Reservoir. Um, that, that water is, a, is, is not a, a, an infinite source uh, of, of water for the city uh, or for the district in general. And so by the end of this calendar year, the district anticipates it will only have around 7,000 acre feet left. Um, and by the way, that assumes that there's no new state water, meaning it doesn't rain at all uh, at the end of this year. So assuming it does not rain at all, uh, they are estimating 7,000 acre feet left. And that will be available to the district as well as the subcontractors 
including Morro Bay, in 2023, so next year. So even if we have another dry year next year uh, where we get zero allocation, for example, from the state, uh, we can still draw down from this 7,000 acre feet uh, that's expected to be there at the end of this calendar year for all of next year. Now, what is 7,000 acre feet? How, how much water is that? Well, let's just go back. Uh, you can see that of all the subcontractors all together, um, we are only pulling around 4,800. So just by the math, um, we do expect to have enough water for all of this year and all of next year. And again, that assumes no rain, no anything for, for the next year and a half. So potentially there's even more water uh, there for Morro Bay after 2023. Uh, Morro Basin, wanna point out that this, uh, that state water is an interruptible source of supply. Um, I'll, I'll just jump down here. Uh, every year in November, uh, the state water project does a shutdown for maintenance purposes. Sometimes it's one week, sometimes it's two weeks, sometimes it's four weeks. Uh, this year, unfortunately, they've, they've let us know that uh, they will be doing a full four week shutdown. Uh, and I say unfortunately because we're in the middle of a historic drought, and, um, but they, they, they have some necessary maintenance that they want to do during November. So uh, during those four weeks, we, we have to find other water. So uh, the Morro Basin Wells and the Brackish Water Reverse Osmosis uh, Facility together will supplement the supply. Um, so we basically get the water out of our ground during these shutdowns. Uh, water's a little tight right now, again, because of the drought, but uh, we can inject state water uh, this summer uh, because we are putting in a new pilot injection well as part of the water reclamation facility project. That, that pilot injection well is expected to go in this summer, uh, and we're going to be testing it. Um, for purposes of testing the hydrogeological conditions in Morro Basin. And uh, we can actually pull that water out and use it. So we do have supply uh, for the month of November. Additionally, uh, the Central Coast Water Authority has uh, promised us that we can take up to 40 acre feet if we need it during the shutdown. Uh, now that's their emergency supply. So, you know, this is this, we don't necessarily want to take this if we don't have to, but that, that is water that is stored up here in the, in the Polonio Pass. So state water shutdown will happen, but we can still get that water from state water pipes, if that makes sense. So, sorry, I'm skipping around here. Uh, okay, so that is the annual water supply and demand assessments. Um, what's part of that is also the water shortage consent contingency plan. And this guides the city in identifying anticipated shortages and implementing the appropriate water shortage stage and response actions to allow for efficient management during water shortages. So it's, again, it's part of the annual water supply and demand assessment. Uh, and this lays out stages of water conservation or water restrictions. Um, and so I'll, I'll buzz through these. You may be familiar with it. They're, they're also included in the staff report. Um, but stage one is kind of a low level of restriction. So there's some limitations on uh, washing vehicles and boats and sidewalks and things like that. Um, they don't want, we don't want to see any outdoor irrigation from gutter runoff. Um, there's some restrictions on marinas and waterfront installations, and then we can only get served drinking water by request at restaurants. Uh, stage two, we move to a moderately restricted water supply conditions. Uh, no water at all to be used for cleaning driveways, patios, sidewalks, et cetera. And outdoor irrigation is prohibited um, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, all consumers are directed to use no more water than necessary to maintain landscaping. Uh, when we get to st stage three, it gets it gets a, uh, a bit stricter. So after your irrigation, um, in irrigation of private and public landscaping, turf areas and gardens is permitted at even number of addresses only Wednesdays and Sundays and odd number of addresses only Tuesdays and Saturdays. So this is essentially a, a two day a week restriction. 
there's restrictions on marinas and waterfront installations. Um, not allowed to use fresh water to wash down boats. Um, emptying and refilling swimming pools and commercial spas is prohibited, except in cases where it might be a public health issue or a structural issue. Uh, use of potable water for compaction or dust control is prohibited and dysfunctional water fixtures in public or commercial facilities uh, need to be repaired uh, once uh, we give them notification. Then we have stage four and stage five. So stage four, the difference between stage four and stage three is largely we move from uh, watering uh, twice a day in stage three, I'm sorry, twice a week in stage three to once a week in stage four for outdoor irrigation. Um, and we also have a, a prohibition on watering cars uh, by hose. Stage five is, uh, is emergency water supply conditions. And um, under emergency water supply conditions, the city council uh, can essentially impose whatever water rationing requirements um, are, are necessary for us to maintain uh, health and safety um, water rations for, for folks in the city. So those are the five stages. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about what some of what some of you have heard in the news about uh, state requirements for water conservation and what we've been doing. Uh, so earlier this year in March, the governor requested a 20% reduction in water use compared to 2020. And then in May, uh, he came back and added some more aggressive conservation measures. Uh, no more watering of non-functional turf. Non-functional turf uh, is basically medians. Um, your lawn is not non-functional turf. That, that has a function. Um, but anything that's being watered that doesn't have a function uh, is, is, is now banned from being watered. So what have we been doing? Well, actually, since July 2021, we um, voluntarily went into stage three of our water shortage contingency plan. And we've been in there ever since. Um, and so currently we are uh, in compliance with what the governor has asked with regards to restrictions. Uh, however, we have not yet met the 20% reduction compared to the year 2020, as the governor requested earlier this year. Uh, we're not alone in that. Actually, statewide water usage is up 19%. Um, and it's, it's worth a very brief discussion talking about why that is. So as a baseline year for comparison, um, 2020 is very problematic, most obviously because of the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic uh, caused a lot of changes in our economy and, and, uh, and, and in our behavior. Um, in the beginning, people traveled less. They didn't go to restaurants. Um, they were home. They weren't in the office. Uh, and so based on our review of some of the data, even from Morro Bay, you can see that in the year 2020, water usage is a bit out of whack from one month to the next. Um, and so there are times, for example, this year where we've seen that we are 20% above uh, our water usage in 2020, but then other months where we're actually below it. And so um, it's that kind of inconsistency and like, like a zigzag chart of usage in 2020 that um, is, is just problematic uh, for 2020 to be used as, as a base year. Uh, that said, uh, we are in stage three still. And so we are handing out uh, placards and informational material to, to businesses in the community uh, and hotels. Um, we're, we're putting in uh, some instructions on how to save water. Uh, you may have seen these at restaurants. Again, we're asking folks to, or we're asking restaurants to not offer water um, unless by request. Um, and then there's some um, tips for homeowners too on, on how to save water. So those are all available. And um, a lot of these items have been handed out to businesses in the community. Uh, so maybe before I move on, actually, I'll, I'll go through this one short section and then I'll take some questions, uh, if that's okay with you, Chair, before we go into the WEUs. That sounds great. Thank you. You're welcome. So what are the conclusions uh, of the annual water demand and supply assessment? 
and what are our strategies. So here is a graph uh, that shows <clears throat> the next year or so's um, water supply and demand. So this blue line going across the graph is our constrained demand. Constrained demand uh, means our current water demand based on the restrictions that we have in place. Um, and you can see that um, these bars are uh, supplies kind of stacked on one another. So the blue is state water, uh, not just our allocation, but also the stored water that we're getting now. Um, the yellow is our Morro Basin groundwater. We talked a little bit about our ability to uh, inject uh, state water uh, through the pilot injection well that's being installed this summer. So that's where that shows up. You can see in August, September, October, November, we'll have some uh, water, some additional water in the in the basin uh, because of that. And then that central uh, Central Coast Water Authority uh, promise of their emergency supplies um, that can be made available to us if we need them are here in November. Uh, the reason you don't see the blue the blue in in November is uh, as discussed earlier. That is when state water shuts down. Uh, so we won't be able to get any of our uh, stored allocation from state water during that month. As you can see, uh, our supplies are well above uh, our constrained demand. Um, you know, in some cases uh, here, for example, our, our constrained demand is around 80 acre feet that month, and we have around 140 acre feet available. Um, so this leads us to the conclusion that uh, we currently have enough water for the needs of the city. Uh, and again, I do wanna emphasize, this is a, a short-term look, right? This is in the, in the next year or so. Uh, this is a short-term look at our water supply and demand. So our conclusion um, and our strategies from the conclusion, one, uh, manage demand. So we would like to maintain a stage three water restrictions or higher depending on the situation um, and manage supply. Um, we plan to utilize city and district stored water, um, stored state water to, to meet the majority of the anticipated demand in fiscal year 22-23. We'll supplement with the Morrow Basin um, through that state water injection through the pilot injection well to provide additional water during the November shutdown. And also we will have the reserve water available to us from the um, Central Coast Water Authority as a, as a backup supply. So that is our kind of roadmap for the next 12 months or so. So uh, before I go on to water equivalency units, um, are there any questions? So I will look to Asia and Joe, do you have any questions for staff? Um, I, I have a quick question about um, you, the our water usage in 2021 compared to 2020. If 2020 isn't a good baseline, have you guys compared it to 2019 and seen how that compares? Uh, you know, I will. I, th I think I have Damaris Hansen on the line um, who could answer that question better, but I do want to say the, the reason we're doing 2020 is because that is uh, the, the governor's request. Um, but Damaris, if you're there, can you chime in on whether or not we've compared to other years? I know you and I have looked at tables together. Yeah, um, we have looked at it compared to other years. Um, we've compared it to 21 and um, we've um, compared 21 to 19, 2019. Um, it's a little bit higher than 2019, but it's not significant and it doesn't jump around as much either. It's just that 2020 is, is kind of a, a strange year to compare to. And that's, that's what a lot of the cities have been kind of complaining about as well, that it's a, it's a tough year to complain, com compare back to. So it is, our current usage is a little bit higher than it was in the past in 2019, but it's pretty minor. Not 20% higher. Not 20% higher now. So um, my second question is, um, what happens if the state water project, you know, if we continue to have, you know, 
not just one more year of dry years as you look at in your presentation, but three or four more years and the state water project continues to give low allocations or even decrease the allocations. Um, yeah, that, that's, like? that's an excellent question. Um, and I'll answer that first by saying that as, as discussed earlier, uh, at the end of this year, uh, we'll have uh, 7,000 acre feet not only to the city, but to the city and the other 10 subcontractors. Um, and so we, we are um, more or less guaranteed an additional calendar year of, of that state water. Uh, there's still anticipated to be more left after that um, for 2024. And in looking at it, uh, you know, we, we would supplement our, um, that allocation with the water we have in the in the Morro Basin. Um, in 2025, we anticipate recycled water will be online, um, and that will provide uh, additional resiliency uh, to our groundwater basin because we're going to be injecting purified wastewater into the ground and then pulling it up and treating it um, and putting it into the water distribution system. Mm. Joe. Yeah, that, that last statement, the resiliency of the uh, water that's coming from the reclamation plant in 24, 25, what kind of volume are we talking about? How many, how many acre feet? So currently uh, we're looking at being able to pull, and, and Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's 871 acre feet out of the ground um, total from, from the Morro Basin. Dan, can you expand on that? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> Greg, that's kind of an accurate representation. Um, the the wharf facility, I want to say, and we're, we're putting together updated estimates of how much water it will provide for injection into the Morro Basin, but likely somewhere around the range of five to 600 acre feet per year of water would be available for injection if we ran the indirect potable reuse system full time. Uh, by injecting that in additional water into the Morro Basin, and then the city could extract uh, estimates of up to around 900 acre feet total of water uh, from the Morro Basin, both a combination of uh, native groundwater that's in the basin, as well as augmented supplies uh, from the IPR program. And so that, that wouldn't quite meet the city's full demand based on current estimates for a year, but it would meet uh, up to 90% you know, or so uh, of current demands. And that, that 900 or so acre feet would be after the 25% is deducted because of the high nitrate concentration or before? Um, it could be. That's another component that is being uh, evaluated. Um, with the injection of the high quality water from uh, the wharf facility, it's there's um, the potential that the nitrate concentrations in the Morro Basin can be, de be diluted to the point where we don't have to use the, the Brackish Water RO facility. Likely in the beginning, we would, would still con continue to have to run that facility until sufficient uh, high quality water was injected into the basin. But ultimately, ideally, we could get to a point where we don't have to run that facility due to the decrease in nitrate convert concentrations. Okay, thank you. Is that it, Joe? Yeah, for now, yeah. Okay. Um, are we looking at anything um, with the county? I know we heard a presentation the other day that suggested um, they're looking at some regional approaches um, for, for water, whether some kind of desal thing and whether Morro Bay would consider being part of that. Yes, uh, that's all very, very preliminary. Right. Um, staff hopes to take a resolution to city council sometime this fall um, to uh, come out as a participant of that evaluation. Um, and uh, that evaluation is expected to take some time. I mean, the regional desal, you know, that kind of project could take 10 years um, to put together. 
but um, we certainly want to be, we, we don't want to miss the boat. Uh, we want to be part of the evaluation. And part of that evaluation is going to help us understand if it, if it makes sense for Morbe to be a part of it. Um, further, internally, um, we're going to be looking to council for some direction next week on a, a fuller evaluation of our water supply, uh, particularly our long range water supply. A, a lot of what we looked at in this presentation was short term, right? A year or two years. You know, what happens if it doesn't rain for three years, that kind of thing. Um, and, and those are important questions, but uh, staff has, has an interest uh, based on community input and, and input from uh, the, the PWAB and, and, and the council, as well as some um, community groups. Uh, that what, what does the long-term picture look like? And so that's something that, uh, again, we'd like to uh, evaluate as well. I, I will say um, that, you know, if it were true that for some reason, it just you know didn't rain for 700 days or something. Um, the other option that the city has available is to bring in temporary desal. So there's like portable desal units that that we could bring in uh, to again augment our supply. Um, so we we do have other options. Um, you know, should we go a couple more years without any rain, which you know is is pretty unlikely. Also, if it does rain, even if we get a low allocation next year, but we do get rain, um, that means that more water would be available in the San Luis Reservoir. Uh, so those numbers I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, about 7,000, um, and once you pull out 4,500 from that, it's like you know 2,500. Well, you know it, it could maybe rain two or three times it doesn't solve the drought issue, but it increases the amount of stored water that the district has in San Luis Reservoir, which would extend available water beyond 2023 and possibly through 2024. Uh, again, should we go through a, another year or so of drought? <clears throat> hmm. it, it's pretty scary numbers, really. I mean, it, I understand how it's all figured out, but Oh, you're gambling on the weather, which is a challenge. Joda, is your hand up again? Yeah. Well, it, it, it is, yes. Um, you know, I, I, I think I understand the projections for the short term. And, and I, I thank you for the information because it's very clear. Um, but the long-term issue is, you know, clearly an issue. And, and you know, the elephant in the room is, um, you know, we, we characterize this as a drought, but the underlying assumption is it's an unusual situation. But we could find a lot of knowledgeable experts who say that the drought will become the normal and the typical. And so, you know, what does that mean in terms of uh, long term planning and changes? You know, uh, yeah, now I know nobody wants to actively think about moratoriums and building them what that means. On the other hand, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what, you know, the alternatives are going to be. I, I would really like this. I'd, I'd like to find out what other communities in, um, in California, similarly sized, are starting to think about it. What kind of, you know, long term policy are they putting together to address that and, and is, you know, some kind of you know, moratorium uh, on new construction being contemplated. Maybe not. Maybe not this year. Maybe not next year. But is that? I'd like to find out what the, what the elements should be in addressing this problem. Other than, hey guys, everybody use less water. Um, that doesn't strike me as an adequate solution. Yeah, and so I'll I'll remark that that it sounds like um, what you're interested in seeing is something like an emergency plan. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I can let, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Dan comment on that. But I, I will say that uh, you, you've heard in the news, I'm sure that there's a moratorium in Los Osos, uh, Cambria for building. Um, those are communities who whose only source of water is, is their groundwater. And fortunately, the city of Morro Bay is not in that 
same position as those communities, uh, even though we share a geography, uh, because we are hooked up to the state water pipe. Um, and interestingly, uh, drought conditions in San Luis County, for example, are certainly, um, that's certainly something we follow and take very seriously. But the source of the majority of our water is not from San Luis Obispo County. It's from snowpack in the Sierras that comes down um, into the Delta. And so, it, you know, it may be possible, for example, that Southern California or San Luis Obispo County um, experiences an extended drought, but Northern California doesn't. Uh, next year or the following year. And um, it, it, again, I, there are, um, and every community is in a different situation based on their water supply portfolio. And so um, I, I, I want to just suggest that we should all keep that in mind. Uh, we, we need to base our um, projections, expectations, um, concerns on what our water supply portfolio is, uh, because a lot of what's in the media is uh, related to other other communities that have very different water supply portfolios than, than we do. Um, you know, currently, at least over the next two years, uh, we, we're in a, a pretty good position. Uh, time will tell about, you know, weather and things like that. But uh, right now, because of state water and because of recycled water coming in and in a couple of years, um, you know, it, it's it's not it's not quite doomsday at, at this time. Um, Dan, do you want to comment on what other communities are doing in terms of building moratoriums or what their emergency plans look like? Yeah, I can add, Greg, that, um, you know, I, I would agree, like you said, every, every water utility has a unique water supply portfolio and, and the ability of that portfolio to to provide water during extended droughts uh, differs. And, and that is very important, critical information in assessing your ability to meet future demands. Um, the, the standard practice that we have in California right now for assessing supply demand is, was established by, or is, is established by the Department of Water Resources in the Urban Water Management Plan. And so the city recently updated its urban water management plan in 2020, and we'll be updating it again in 2025. Um, the urban water management plan is a is a long term water supply planning document that and the requirements of preparing that plan is for a water utility to look at its not just its supply demand um, uh, balance in the near term, um, but also to look out uh, 20, 30 years and project what the future supply demand balance uh, is anticipated to look like. And also to project, you know, um, how uh, that agency's water supply portfolios, future water supply demand balance is, is projected to be in an extreme drought situation. You know, a five year consecutive dry period is, is the criteria that DWR requires for assessing um, an agency's ability to provide water. And so, you know, I, I think it's, it's really that, that long-term planning approach that is, is critical for agencies to not just understand whether or not they have enough water for their current customers in, in a current drought, uh, but really what, what does that long-term picture look like uh, with potential increased demand with additional development, but also with potential increased supply availability or, or resiliency provided by new projects. So for example, right now, when we look at near-term water supply demand for Morro Bay, you know, we're really looking at state and Morro Basin supplies. And, uh, but when we look out into the future, we start incorporating the IPR project and the additional water supply benefits and resiliency that that provides the city. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a great question and I don't know if we're done with this topic, but it, it, it would be a great segue for the rest of Greg's presentation where we, we look at some of the UWMP and the long-term supply analysis that was done within that document to help inform uh, these uh, growth decisions. Thanks for that, Dan. Um, I do see another hand up and just a quick question for you. 
what year are we considering ourselves in in terms of droughts? I mean, it feels like a long time since we've seen significant rain. So are we in year two? Are we in year three? Where are we considering? Where does the state consider Central California right now? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know exactly where the state considered us in the drought. I know in the water industry, there's a bit of debate. I mean, some experts say that we've been in a drought since 2006, and we've just had a couple of wet years. I, I personally tend to characterize it that we, you know, I feel like we've been in a drought since 2020. Um, we had hot, above average rainfall in 2017 and 2019 and alleviated some of our, our drought issues that we were, were suffering from from the previous drought, as again, as I define it, of 2012 through 2016. So, um, you know, I think you could characterize it as we're in year three of a drought, or you could characterize it as we're in year 12 or year 16. Um, okay. but, yeah, that's kind of subjective. Um, Joe, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to make the comment. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, water availability in a, well, to be generous, five years, but we're in a two or three year chunk. And, but we're also talking about building decisions as they relate to houses and, and multiple units and, and, and hotels, you know, that easily has a 60 or 70 year range. And uh, I, I'm bothered by that because we're, we're we're doing some planning that at this point at best seems to be short term. And, and we're, we're doing some permitting, which is very, very long term. And uh, I am uh, bothered by how those two things might intersect. Thanks, Joe. Asia? Yeah, on that note, I think it would be really interesting to learn a little bit more about our um, local uses. I know in the report, um, it talks about, you know, residential single family versus multifamily versus um, commercial water usage. And it sounds like we're about to go over some of that, but I think um, it would behoove us as a commission to get more um, educated on what's what or for me at least get educated on what's going on locally with water use as we make some of these permitting decisions so um and then my second question or comment is just about um updating our these plans that were presented as data changes and as data is updated um, how flexible are these annual or every other year plans, water plans, um, if the state suddenly changes course partway through the year for some reason, um, are these local plans flexible for our water usage? And you want to take that? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, the next section of the presentation can cover the, the uses component of this, but I, I think I can address Joe's concern as well as, as your, your question, Asia. Um, I, I would agree, Joe, that, yeah, short-term drought planning should be separate from long-term demand planning or development. You know, the Urban Water Management Plan, again, is a document that's required by, by DWR. It's required to be updated every five years. Um, and it, it, it includes both a component that looks at short-term drought planning. Um, and then also it looks at a component that looks on a much longer time horizon out through the last uh, UWMP, you know, prepared in 2020 or for 2020 included an evaluation of supply demand out through 2045, which is, you know, incorporates the, the city's, uh, I believe the city's, you know, build out uh, and anticipated build out conditions. And so it's, it's when you're looking at making those longer term decisions, it is important to look at those longer term water supply scenarios because, and as I mentioned earlier, incorporating potential new supplies as well as potential increased or, or, or um, changes in demand. Um, the, the, the specific piece that we're focused on on this portion of the presentation and this agenda item 
is a short-term water supply assessment. And that, that was actually a new addition to the UW, to the water code and the requirements of the 2020 urban water management plan is that DWR it doesn't just want agencies to look at their water supply demand portfolio every five years. Um, they now want agencies to look at it on an annual basis because we are seeing these, these significant variations in water supply availability. And it's important that agencies are planning for, you know, to get through the current year's drought, but the potential for a, another dry year. And so that's, that, that was really the, 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 the focus and, and is the requirement of the annual water supply demand assessment is um, to look at the current year supply, as Greg mentioned, and then assume we're going to get one more dry year. And really, it's intended to inform near-term water management decisions around more specifically, you know, what stage of the water shortage contingency plan should be the city be implementing. And the water shortage contingency plan is really a plan to address near-term water supply issues. And it isn't really designed to manage, you know, long-term water supply decision. That's that's a whole separate mechanism, you know, that, that goes through planning and, and requires a much longer time horizon. Okay. Um, perhaps we should move along to the WEU section of the presentation, if that's okay with the commissioners. Sure, and we'll be happy to continue taking questions um, at the conclusion of this section. So going into the WEUs, um, this, this is really with us because of a measure in 1984, Measure F, um, and it was adopted as a growth management system. It created the WEU program. So the goals of the measure were to regulate addition of new water users to the city's water system and to ensure the demand for water does not exceed available water supply. Um, a WEU is a measurement of water use equal to the average amount of water used by a single family residence over the period of one year, uh, which translates to 90 gallons per capita per day, or if you like cu uh, cubic feet, 8,732 or 0.2 acre feet per year. And this, this touches on a comment that I, I think uh, uh, Joe and Asia brought up. Uh, so these are actually issued during the planning permit process, not, not during the building, I, I think. And I don't have the history on this, but I believe they used to be um, issued during the building process. And the issue there was, was that a WEU is not intended to be a short term. Uh, it isn't the, a, a decision about issuing a WEU is not, not intended to be uh, on short-term water supply. And so building uh, happens much more quickly than the planning process, which is very early on in the, in, in the development phase, as you know. And so we now issue those during the planning permit approvals. And that's because we want to associate it with the long-term uh, water implications that, that it comes with. So, uh, going back to, um, what Dan was talking about, we rely on the urban water management plan supply and demand comparisons for future multiple dry year droughts to test the adequacy of our supply portfolio to meet future demands, including new developments that require WEU. So this, this is the model that uh, we ran as part of the urban water management plan. And I'll just take a second to explain this. Um, this is a five year, five consecutive year um, scenario. So this assumes five consecutive dry years. Um, and this is based on the worst, driest five years in, in our history um, at the time of writing this, which was uh, last fall. The demand here is not our current demand, but the demand is the demand at full build out of the city um, projected by the general plan in 2045. Uh, so again, our current demand is somewhere around 1100. And uh, we have again, a, a bar graph of available supplies. Uh, so the gray is state water at our 1313 acre feet per year allocation. Then we have stored state water 
<clears throat> and our, our groundwater. And so, again, this is not right now. This is not our current uh, situation. So IPR, in theory, could be applied any year that it was necessary. But this is based on, uh, in our history, the five driest consecutive years. So in this scenario, uh, with IPR included, uh, year one, we're doing just fine. We're getting our full allocation from the state. We also have stored state water and our groundwater. Um, year two, uh, our, our state water allocation goes down a bit, about 70 or so acre feet. And we have uh, less stored water available. Our groundwater is the same. Year three, uh, we're down to 180 acre feet from the state, but we have plenty of stored water still in year three. Uh, and we can supplement with uh, our, store, our, our, excuse me, our groundwater. And year four is, is really the test year. Um, in the model, we have now 721 acre feet coming from the state, but no stored water. Uh, and then we have 407 out of the ground. And then the augmented supply with uh, IPR, recycled water. And then in year five, um, it starts going back up. Again, no stored water, but we have the full allocation from the state at 13, 13 acre feet and uh, supplemented with our groundwater and no, no need for IPR. Maybe before I move on, does anyone have questions about this model? I do. Do they? So is the reason that you feel in the fourth year there would be an increase in state water because they would know that we don't have that ability to rely on the stored water? Uh, good, good question. And I could see why it might, it might look like that. I, I want to emphasize that this, this model is, is based on actual dry years in the city's history. It's not based on conjecture or anything like that. And so this is um, what happened essentially in, in those five years. Uh, state water became more available in year four in the worst five consecutive dry years we've ever had. So we are following that model, but now including a higher demand that, that we didn't have uh, during those five years and also the ability to utilize IPR. Okay. Uh, yeah, just just for reference, I, if it's helpful, this this actually models the drought <clears throat> uh, that the city and the state experienced from 2012 through 2016. Okay. So there was state water availability in 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 14 or 12, 13, a very low allocation, five percent in 2014, and then a, a moderate allocation that rebounded in, in uh, 2015. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Joe, did you have a question? Well, it, it's not so much a question. I mean, you, you could look at that graph and you could also say, well, in the, uh, the, the, the worst drought that we suffered to date, uh, the city was to get its, not its entire, or almost its entire state allotment in three of those five years. And, um, you know, I'm skeptical about that happening going forward for a similar number of years. That's, uh, that's, a hard, that's a hard one for me to put my confidence in. Yeah, and I, that's totally understandable. I, I do wanna again emphasize this is, this is a model based on um, what actually happened. It's certainly not a prediction, right? Uh, I mean, anything, anything can happen. Um, so, uh, but, we don't want to, so it, it's, it's our responsibility to give the best possible information we have as staff. And to do that, we choose to use actual data based on actual dry years. And so this is the most conservative scenario that we could find in the city's history. Uh, and so that's why you're seeing it, but you're right. I mean, that doesn't mean that it, it can't get worse, in fact, uh, right now, we, we've had two 5% allocation years in a row, which is the 180, right? And so currently, right now, we're actually, I'm not sure if, if all five years together would qualify as the as worse than this scenario, but 
Um, if, if it's not, it's, it's, it's certainly close. And, and, and that's one of the constraints of using model data is it, it looks back in history, uh, but we all know, you know, things can certainly change. Yeah, and, and I wanna say, I, I really appreciate your modeling. You're, you're, you're showing the proper responsibility that your modeling is based on, on facts. Uh, we here at the commission, uh, I think our responsibility is a little bit larger than that because we have to seriously consider, you know, the untoward consequences that might arise in the future, which admittedly may, uh, may not even be based on any facts that we can look at today. Uh, that's, that's the difference between your responsibility and ours. For sure. And Greg, the, the, the demand here is at build out, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so our demand way down the road. <laughs> Our demand right now would be, excuse me, around here. Mm -hmm. So with current demand, we may not even hit IPR in that fourth dry year. Because if, yeah, if you add these two up, that's 1128. And that's right around our current demand, our annual demand. <clears throat> so is IPR only used in um, as like a last case scenario or? Currently that's, that's our planned approach. Yes. And that's because of some of the operational costs associated with, with IPR. Okay. Hmm. Any other questions from the commission? Okay. It's a good discussion. Thank you. So um, staff's conclusion uh, and our recommendation is that um, for the next fiscal year, um, the city allocates uh, 50 WEUs for residential development and 65 for commercial development for a total of 115. Um, that's essentially what what we've always, or in, in, at least in, in, in recent years, uh, recommended. I do want to note um, that 115 WEUs is not a comprehensive list of all building activity. Somebody can add an addition to their home. Um, that's that, that does not hit a WEU. Um, ADUs are not included in that. Okay. Um, and that's because of how, how state law, and, and Scott, I think, can clarify this better than I can, but that's because of how state law looks at ADUs. Um, they are only required for single family residential and multifamily residential when development is on an empty lot or when a change in use is proposed, um, such as changing from an office building to an apartment. So that's when WEUs kick in. And to give you an idea of last year, we had the same allocation, 65 and 50 for 115. And only not even nine were issued, so eight single family homes, 0.94 multifamily homes, um, which resulted in our estimated demand increase of 1.78 acre feet per year. So staff, we and on the staff side look at that in context of something like this. Um, 1.78 acre feet is, uh, I, I think what point point uh, five percent or so of of uh, our total uh, demand. So um, that that's that's why our recommendation is that we continue with the same allocation this year as as in as in previous years. Um, also, largely because again, WEUs are a long range planning tool. Um, and we don't anticipate being in a drought forever. We anticipate um, being able to expand our water supply portfolio in the city. Um, and also because there's a history of underutilization of the WEUs that we do allocate. Um, I don't know that we've ever hit in, in recent history uh, the limit of, and, and maybe Scott or Damaris can speak to that, um, but my understanding is every year it's somewhere between eight and 10 or 11 WUs actually being issued. Uh, and then once they're issued, it could take, you know, one, two or three years before uh, the, those new units even hit against our demand. So 
that's the presentation and I'll take questions. It's really interesting, you know, given that our biggest need is housing, you know, there would be a tendency in my mind to want to switch those ratios. Let's issue more for housing than for commercial uses. And yet sounds like we're not even getting close to the issuance on either of those uses. So I don't know if Scott maybe has, or, or Damaris has a comment on that. The the ratio that that is, um, is it's actually set in Measure F. Okay. So yeah, that's yeah. okay. One hundred and thirty percent has to go to commercial. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Joe, your hand signal is up. Are you? Do you have a question or? No, actually, actually I don't. Just I just don't know how to put that thing down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll see if I can fix it. Uh, any other questions for staff on any of this? And then we should open for public comments. I guess I'm just wondering if everything, you know, what would be our projected number or our projected use if everything that's in the planning queue were built this year by some miracle? <laughs> if we know that number. You're on mute. Yeah, get back to you on that. We wouldn't. We don't have that information available to you know. But presumably, Asia, a lot of those things that are in the queue were already awarded the WEUs, like the big hotel on Forty One um, or Tascadero Road, um, housing development on Tascadero Road. Those have already been awarded WEUs, and you know they're not online yet which was one of my questions too, how do you judge that? But um, the WEUs for both of those things were already allocated um, mm -hmm, because right. we, we, we moved to, as uh, Mr. Qualick said, uh, we moved away from allocating them at building permit issuance to allocating them at planning permit issuance. So in either instance, and that was a few years ago that we did that, those projects would be picked up in either one of those scenarios. Yeah, yeah. that was a smart move, I think. It, it helps for future planning. Yeah, and okay. that was why it was, that's why it was done, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's open this up for public comment. Anthony, do we have anybody waiting for public comment on this? Uh, thank you, Chair Stewart. Currently, I see Betty Windholtz with her hand raised. All right. Okay, Betty, Windholtz. you are unmuted. Thank you, this is Betty Winholtz. Um, you know, I'm a, a math tutor by trade, so I want to throw out a little bit of numbers. Um, and I first want to thank Mr. Qualick for answering some of my questions and um, put some of this together based on that and then might have a few more questions. Um, but if you consider for this year, uh, 180 acre feet from state water, and if we take the 40 from the CCWA, and if we use the full 35, 435 from the Moro Well Basin, and we take the full 238 uh, acre feet from the reservoir, we're at 893 acre feet, which is just under 900. But as it was mentioned, we use 1100 per year. So we would have to borrow 200 acre feet for this year. And then if you look at the second year, which we have to account for, um, then we still have that 180 acre feet uh, from state water. We have the 435 from the well basin, but then that's it which is 615 acre feet, which means we now have to borrow 500 acre feet to make it through our second year. So it seems to me if we're borrowing water because we don't have it, um, I'm questioning whether we should be handing out more uh, building permits. Um, and I think it's important to note that um, if you account for 0.2 acre feet per new housing unit, then just that project on 41, the, the housing, um, that's an additional 8.2 acre feet per year, which is not included in the current 1100 acre feet. So how much more acre feet is that 83 room hotel with a swimming pool, with the new uh, vacation rentals buildings that are really self 
sufficient hotels or whatever you want to call them. And so I think that we have a number of projects that we've committed water to, but we haven't been told how much water that is in addition to the 1100 acre feet that we currently use. So I'm, I, I think we're kind of on the edge and it makes me nervous that we would um, continue to allow for more, more um, storage. Um, that chart that the table that showed the orange um, water from state water that's going to go through the the sewer plant or the IPR, which you haven't defined, which it sounds like is is the injection wells, but you're going to inject clean state water into the ground, into a toxic field at the power plant, and then pull it out and clean it again, which doesn't make a lot of good sense to me. But my question is, is that orange water in addition to our 180 acre feet, or is that part of the 180 acre feet? Um, I also would have the question um, that that acreage that's available from the district and storage, I'm assuming Pismo and other agencies are going to want to draw on that water. And it, I would not be surprised if the county or the district then wants to up how much they're going to charge us for this extra water. Maybe they won't, maybe they'll be kind. Um, and then I had a peripheral question, which was when do we stop paying the base rate with our uh, state water, I think it goes off tw in 2023. Um, and so we will only be having the cost for the amount of water we use and not for the structure, but maybe you can correct me on that. Um, so those are my concerns and those are my figures. And those are things that I would encourage you to at least reduce the WEUs, if not not allow any, because I think we don't know how much money, how much water we're using. Thank you. Thanks, Betty. Anthony, do we have anybody else in the queue? Um, thank you, Chair Stewart. Currently, I do not see any raised hands left in the queue. Thank you. Then we'll close public comment. Um, Greg, do you have any answers to some of Betty's questions and concerns? Yeah, sure. Um, Betty uh, was using the term borrowed water um, it's it's not quite borrowed water that we're using this year and next year. It's um, it's stored water that's been stored by uh, the district on behalf of the city of Morro Bay because of our um, our drought buffer, uh, but as well uh, additional unsubscribed allocation that that the district has in San Luis Reservoir, and that uh, they've made available to the subcontractors. <clears throat> so. I, I wouldn't characterize it as borrowed water, but it certainly is a limited supply. Uh, it's a finite supply. Um, so to your question though, about how the how the numbers add up to 1100 to meet our demand, it's it's through that stored water. And, uh, I'd like to say the, the effect of that stored water um, on Morro Bay is uh, essentially it's, it's just like any other year, we're receiving the same amount of water through the pipe. Uh, it's just not our regular allocation. It's from stored water. Um, in terms of uh, the remark about toxic water, uh, we don't um, put toxic water in our water distribution system. Our, our water is treated. Um, and so if there's uh, further interest from the commission, um, Damaris uh, can, can comment on that. Um, uh, there was something about in addition to 180 acre feet. I don't, I don't recall. I, I didn't finish that note. Um, increased charges. My understanding is that uh, this was the last year that we paid into the um, capital costs uh, for the state water project. Um, and so we will no longer be making those payments. Um, however, we will continue to pay a base rate uh, not related to those capital costs for the ongoing maintenance of the state water project, uh, as well as paying for how much water we actually take in. And if there's more detail needed on that, Dan, Dan Heimel can provide that. Um, and, oh, and there, I think there was a question about, uh, are we 
going to be paying additional money for um, stored water or any of the water from the Polonio Pass? Uh, and, and the answer is no, we'll just pay for the water that, that comes through the pipe just as we would in, in any other year. Um, and by pipe, I mean comes through state water pipe. So I, I believe I've answered those questions, but uh, we'd be happy to clarify or, or, or go back. Great, thank you. Okay, back to the commission. Um, any other discussion on this? Joe. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm left with this notion, you know, that it, over the next 20 years, what is going to be the, the typical uh, percentage allocation for state water? And over the next 20 years, how many drought years are we going to experience in California? And unfortunately, no one has any idea as to what the answer to those two questions are going to be. The, the, the only thing I can say about it is that, you know, Morro Bay and indeed the Central Coast is such a small actor in a state that's dealing with those problems that's as big as California in terms of acreage and as big as population is as, uh, in, pop, in population and acreage. Um, you know, I, it, the problem is going to get addressed uh, and maybe solved, uh, but I don't know if it's going to be done in a timely fashion. And I'm afraid that, you know, Little Moral Bay isn't going to have a whole lot of input in what that solution is. I, I just, you know, I, I mean, I, I could, I could imagine, you know, the state of California, you know, having to deal with, you know, you know, farmlands that can no longer be farmed and, and, uh, food production going down and, and the inflationary price of various food commodities and, and, and all of that stuff. And, you know, what if this, you know, the state just says, well, from now on, um, you know, um, the, the permanent allocation is 10%. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do about this. It, it, no, I'm rambling. I, I it, yeah, no, it's okay. It's a, it's a really um, daunting prospect. One thing that I can say is looking at what we have allocated in previous years and what we've actually built, we are drastically below our predictions of what we felt we had. The other thing that I appreciate about this process is that we see it every year. So, you know, we can look at it and say, okay, we've had some good figures, some good science that suggests that for the next year, we can continue to make these allocations, but we're going to look at it again in 12 months. And, you know, we may not be able to say that in 12 months, just depending on how this year goes and what the, the future predictions are. Um, it, the fact that that ratio and, and the amounts are sort of mandated, um, we are stuck with that, but I do think like other communities, we may hit up against, we have to do more drastic conservation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah. I, and I, I think, you know, at that point, we will be dealing with that as a, as a community and as a county, um, hopefully with some more regional solutions. Yeah, um, maybe, and, and maybe the solution is simply that. Uh, more, more drastic efforts will be self-evident and mm -hmm. they're not self-evident at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, and even with farming and food, some of the kinds of farming and food we do in California is completely inappropriate for our climate. Um, so, you know, there's going to have to be some changes in, in that and how it's done and what kinds of things are done. Yeah, um, enormous political questions with right. you know, all the influences that are brought to bear on those political questions. Right, right. Uh, Asia, did you have any comments? Oh, I mean, nothing more except to say, like, to agree with what you guys are saying and that because we get state water, we're part of a state community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this isn't just about more bay and the water we use, right? It's about what's going on statewide with our water. So, mm -hmm. um, And Greg, did you have any further comments? I saw you turned your screen on. 
Yeah, I mean, something we didn't talk about in the presentation is, is as you're all pointing out, is that this is a, a California problem. I, I, I'd like to zoom out even further. I mean, it's a problem across the American West. Um, and you've probably all saw the, the article that, that someone sent to the commission about uh, the Colorado River and the challenges there. Um, you know, we, we don't get water from the Colorado River here in Moore Bay, but uh, that affects, I believe, seven states. Um, there, there has uh, been some uh, congressional hearings about the, the, the drought in the West. Uh, so there, there are certainly a lot of challenges ahead. Um, I think uh, that the city of Morro Bay uh, is, is, we are doing what we can in terms of what's in our control um, to ensure that we have water resiliency and reliability in the future. Uh, so one, one example of that is of course, recycled water, the recycled water project that we expect to go online in early 2025. Um, and what we'll be taking to council um, <clears throat> next week is the very, again, the preliminary stages of a discussion about what should our long range water supply strategy be? Should we be looking at entering into desal? Um, should we look at partnering with neighboring agencies? Uh, there may be opportunities, for example, to store some of our water um, locally and draw it during wet years and then draw it during dry years uh, that we're currently not taking advantage of. Um, I mentioned that the state water project gives us or can give us, allocates us, 1,313 acre feet a year. Well, we only use around 900 or 1,000 of that. So every year we're giving up around 300 acre feet. We could be storing that somewhere, but but we don't. Um, uh, there, there are other, um, we could look at, uh, for example, purchasing additional drought buffer. Um, that's some, something that certainly the county has encouraged the subcontractors to look at. So uh, we didn't include all of that in the presentation because um, some of it isn't fully cooked yet. We're and we want to go to council and kind of get their blessing on on doing a, a fuller evaluation of this. But again, those are some of the the, the long term strategies that that we hope to look at. And uh, again, when we look at WEUs, I, I would like to emphasize once again that we are talking about long term. I mean, right now we are in an unprecedented drought, and it seems like Every cycle, it's you know a new a new low in terms of um, uh, how much water we're we're actually getting from the state. Uh, but that said, uh, we we are taking steps to ensure that we can keep more water here uh, with IPR. So, you know, the stage is is changing on on our side. We we have a stronger water supply um, now because of state water, and then we'll have an even stronger supply once once we do get IPR. So I I would just encourage the commission to to keep all that in mind when, when thinking about the WEU uh, recommended allocation. Okay. All right. So um, at this point, if there's no more discussion, um, we can make our recommendation um, to the city council to allocate the 50 WEUs for residential development, 65 for commercial development. Um, and to receive and file this report. Do we need a motion on that or do we just? You, you should make a, a motion in a second and then take a vote. Okay. Asia, you wanna do the motion? Sure, I will make a motion to do that. <laughs> to, okay. Recommended by staff. So to basically follow staff recommendations for the planning commission, Joe, did you want a second or would you like me? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, Scott, do you want to call the question? Um, sure. Uh, Commissioner King. Yes. Commissioner Graffia. Yes. Chairperson Stewart. Yes. Where's and I would guy? really, uh, yeah, thank, you. thank you. I'd really like to thank staff um, for all their work and their reports and also um, both you, Greg, and um, Forgot to mention Nancy before on the previous um, item that 
the responses to the public comment is actually super helpful because that answered a lot of questions that I had and I appreciate the thoroughness that, that both of you went into with that. Um, so great work, appreciate all that you do. All right, moving on to unfinished business. We have nothing listed, planning commissioner comments and future agenda items. Joe. I just, a couple of questions. Um, um, one was, you know, with respect to the uh, uh, seashell uh, business of, of the last meeting, mm -hmm. um, did the uh, did the applicant decide to um, appeal that to the uh, city council? Anybody know? Scott so, um, planning commission's uh, decision was not appealable because it's a recommendation. You can't appeal a recommendation. Um, uh -huh. Um, we talked to the applicant, uh, and uh, you know, kind of looking at what our next steps might be on that, and whether they want to move forward to the city council, whether they want to withdraw their application. Um, they've given some indication previously, prior to going to that hearing, that they might just build the houses the way they are, ten lots. Um, so we're kind of going through that process right now. Okay, uh, and then the other thing is what, what, uh, the, the business of. Um... The, the commissioner's uh, written responses to the uh, additional community benefit uh, report. Uh, are we are going to see the written responses or? Well, only if I've provided the written responses. <laughs> Oops. <Yeah, mine. laughs> you're, you're, you're calling out your fellow commissioners there, Commissioner Grappia. Uh, so uh, yeah. yeah, mea culpa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wondered, you know, I'm patient. Um, um, you know, and again, I, sometimes I, I, I skate around what may or may not be appropriate. So please, Scott, uh, jump in if I'm saying something inappropriate. But when, when we had the, uh, the people from Vistra make their presentation to us, I, 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 I had an impression, but, I, but I'm, not part, I'm not positive of it, but I had an impression that what Vistra was saying from their standpoint was that that they would um, remove the stacks and the superstructure and in exchange for building the, the storage facility and at this point. And that was pretty much it. Um, I, but I don't know what the city's, was, uh, first of all, I don't know if I properly discerned that or if I was missing something. And then I have no idea what the city's position is with respect to that. Is there? So, so that is there? simply part of the, um... The equation is them taking down the plant and the stacks and they, you know, on their end, perceive that to be the desire of the, the community and, and certainly the council because the, the council, you know, directed the stacks to be taken down. Um, and I don't think they have any desire to keep the, the actual plant building. And so they've included that in the project description for the battery project. So it's part of the environmental review that we're going through um, now. It's become part of the project description for the environmental impact report. I, I guess what I'm asking is, does, uh, you know, I would suspect that the city wants more to be done, but I, but I don't know that for a fact. I just, would it be possible to have, you know, uh, a responsible council person sort of talk about what their approach to this is? Or is good um, I, I appreciate where you're at um, on this. The the council is not in a in a place um, to have that conversation with the planning commission at this point, in my opinion. Um, I actually do meet regularly with the Vistra subcommittee on council, which is made up of council or with mayor heading and council member Addis. Um, and I don't think we're really probably at that point yet. Although I would imagine um, we are working on the piece of the project uh, related to the land use changes, um, which would involve a master plan. And so we're working um, through the scope and on that right now, um, in fact, uh, the Vistra team is sort of reviewing the scope for that work uh, right now and anticipate getting comments um, back from them on Thursday. And then we'll be touching base with the Coastal Commission to see if that meets sort of their vision on what the master plan would look like and those types of things. And the reason why I gave this long master plan lead in was um, we'll probably start, you know, as part of the master plan process and the public engagement for that. Um, you know, kind of coming out with, you know, things that the community is interested in and seeing an association with the project. So it was kind of a long time getting there, but that's what I was going for there is it'll probably be sort of that discussion from a community-based standpoint will probably take place 
you know, as part of that process is okay. my that's, yeah, what I, that's what I'm the most interested in. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's really taken us kind of a long time to get to the point where we release the notice of preparation for the EIR and that's in the 30 day window right now and we'll end on July um, 3rd. And then uh, they'll be going full bore, Rincon will, the consultant, uh, put together the EIR and then, you know, get that released for public comment and, uh, and that type of thing and run it through the state clearinghouse. So that's kind of where we're at now, so. Thank you. Great, sure. good questions, Joe. Anything else? All right, let's move on to community development director comments. You've just made a few. Yeah, the only other comment that I have is, um, I think we're probably not going to have the July 5th meeting. Okay. I don't have any um, items right now calendared. Uh, I have one other planner that I need to, to, to circle back with to make sure that's the case. But uh, I know Cindy and Nancy don't have anything. So uh, if they don't have anything, uh, I don't have anything. So we'll probably be canceling that meeting. Okay. Uh, so get a little bit of a break. And it is the you know day after the 4th of July. So <laughs> right. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's a nice break for the commission. I don't know. Um, so. Might make sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much in the 95% uh, certain category that we're canceling it, but I just want to follow up one last time with one of the other planners to make sure I'm not missing anything. So. Okay, great. I don't have anything other than that. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to all the commissioners and staff for a good meeting. Um, we will adjourn to possibly July 5th, but maybe July 19th. Yeah. And likely still via Zoom. Uh, we are hoping that we'll be back in person um, then. Oh, I was talking to the city manager about it yesterday, so that would be the uh, that would be the hope. So good. That'd be great. All yeah. right, everybody, stay healthy. Joe, get yourself well. Yeah. And uh, we will see you as soon as we can see y'all. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night.